Behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum, our spirit collection houses 27 kilometres of shelving filled with animal specimens. Many of these specimens were collected by Charles Darwin himself. I'm about to meet a very special octopus who was a subject of great interest for Darwin on his voyage of the Beagle in 1832. So let's go now to meet John Ablett, the museum scientist in charge of looking after Darwin's favourite octopus. Hi John. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for having me today. Oh, pleasure. Um, I'm already learning so much from all of the people that I've met so far, but tell us what you do at the museum. So I'm the senior curator in charge of mollusks and I, uh, along with my colleagues, look after about 8 million uh, mollusk specimens that are housed here in the Natural History Museum. Mollusks are a pretty diverse group of animals. Um, they include things like uh, slugs and snails, you might see in your garden, uh, seashells, uh, bivalves, so clams, mussels, oysters, uh, and squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. Uh, and these kind of animals we call cephalopods. So you get them on land, uh, you get them uh, in the sea, you get them in rivers, and no flying mollusks yet. <laughs> and we use the collection here to learn more about the natural world. And, and yeah, I help, help researchers from all over the world uh, to get the information they need from our specimens to do their research. Fantastic, and you've got some, some lovely examples in, in these drawers here. Yep, uh, these are tropical land snails. I'm really interested in snails from uh, India and Southeast Asia, uh, places like that, and yeah, just um, fabulous collections we have here. Brilliant, um, and speaking of our collections, we're here to see one very special specimen today, aren't we? This one here, tell us about this. Yeah, so this really is a special specimen. Uh, this is a common octopus, Octopus vulgaris, that was collected uh, by Charles Darwin uh, on the Beagle Voyage. So uh, after the, the Beagle set off in December 1831, the first stop was Cape Verde in the January of the following year. And this was, must have been one of the first things that Darwin collected on his epic voyage. That's absolutely incredible. And, and what was it about this octopus that, that captivated Darwin? Well, we actually know quite a lot about that because we have uh, some letters that Darwin wrote to his friends uh, and we have diaries from Fitzroy, uh, the captain of the Beagle. And Fitzroy especially, uh, I think he says something like, uh, a, a child with a new toy could not have been you know, more excited. Such was Darwin's you know, kind of wonder at seeing these. And I mean, very few people, I guess, have seen a live octopus. Um, I'm very lucky I have in the, in the role of my job, but he, he, he hadn't seen one. Um, there were lots of things he noticed about it. He liked the way it kind of walked through the rock pools. Uh, he noticed it changing color. Um, he actually thought this was a completely new discovery. Um, he'd never read before that octopus were able to change colour for signalling, communication, camouflage, things like that. Uh, sadly, it had been known for quite a while. In fact, um, Aristotle wrote about it in about 4 BCE, so it had been known for a very, very long time. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, as scientists, we all see new things that we think we're the first person, but sadly, others have, uh, have done so before. Absolutely, and I, I can understand why, why Darwin was, was enamoured with this octopus. They're amazing animals, aren't they? They've got all kinds of amazing skills, that camouflage, their ability to change their skin texture as well is incredible. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, people often think that cephalopods are a bit otherworldly, a bit alien-like, and you're right, it's, you know, this completely different body plan. I mean, just the word cephalopod itself means head foot because it's got its head next to its feet, or its arms, to give the technical term. Uh, it's a bit like us having our head in the middle of our body, with all our organs on top, our heads here, uh, and then our, our limbs below. And yet, like you say, the way that they can change colour using chromatophores, they can change the texture of their skin to camouflage. I mean, when you see a camouflaged octopus, they're virtually indistinguishable from their background. We know they communicate, they're very intelligent animals. Um, for example, uh, octopus have sort of mini brains, well not quite that, but kind of clusters of nerves, these ganglions in each of the arms, which allows them to uh, react quicker to the environment. So yeah, hugely intelligent, fascinating creatures, and I'm as fascinated as Darwin was. Absolutely. Um, I've heard this specimen referred to as Darwin's pet octopus. What's the story there? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a bit of a loving museum name. Uh, and it's true that Darwin did keep a specimen believed to be this one. He collected several specimens in Cape Verde Islands, uh, but we think this uh, is the one that he kept alive on the ship 
for a short time to observe its behaviour. So maybe not a pet, but a studied animal uh, rather than just purely, uh, purely collected. Um, but he didn't always get everything right. So when he uh, kept the specimen on board, I assume he kept it in some kind of container, probably with the seawater that he collected in. And when he wrote in his letters to his friends, he said that he'd noticed that the octopus bioluminesced at night. And we know that this species, the common octopus, octopus vulgaris, um, doesn't have the ability to produce light. Lots of octopus and squid species do, but this one doesn't. Uh, but what we think more likely is that as Darwin had scooped up uh, the seawater to house uh, this specimen, there's probably some algae or something else, some other microorganism in the water. And as the octopus moved around its container, it was disturbing these, and it was actually them that were producing these flashes of light rather than the octopus itself. Wow. <laughs> and we can see um, there's a, a cut or an incision a along the octopus here. Has it been dissected? And was that Darwin? We don't know. Uh, lots of the specimens uh, that we have, we don't really have uh, a record that we would keep now, especially for the historical specimens of how specimens were dissected or, um, or handled or processed if subsamples were taken. Uh, for example, in this specimen, the beak has been removed. So the mouth parts have been taken out for study. Uh, it's also been dissected along the back uh, to see the organs. This is the mantle region. And you see it's been completely dissected, which allows you to examine the organs in situ. And one interesting thing about this is, you know, now we think oh, Darwin's specimens must have been held in hugely high regard when they came to the museum. But when they came to the museum, they possibly weren't. Darwin probably didn't have quite the legacy that he does now. So it may well have been treated as just another specimen. With historical specimens nowadays, you know, we might be a bit more restrictive about who um, examines them or what kind of destructive sampling we do with a specimen. Um, but of course, if there's an amazing reason, we're, we're always considering, you know, ways that we can uh, sample and process specimens. And actually, the connection with Darwin to the specimen was actually lost for many years. It wasn't uh, until the 1990s when my predecessor actually discovered the link between this specimen uh, and Darwin. So for, yeah, for a long time, it, it wasn't known to be here. And uh, yeah, wow. fairly recently discovered. That's fantastic. Well, John, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. A pleasure. Despite the many years that have passed, it really feels like Darwin's specimens are still very much alive in our collections. From learning about the importance of pigeons to Darwin's theories, to discovering Toxodon, an extinct mammal from South America, and even meeting an octopus, I have learned so much today. And it's safe to say Darwin was certainly busy during his career. As his legacy lives on here at the museum, who knows what Darwin's collections will teach us over the next 100 years? I suppose we'll just have to find out. <laughs>